um, in, right? I couldn't talk to you about sports. I really couldn't talk to you about who won the latest game, basketball or football. But if you ask me about the last X-Men com comic that came out, I can give you an in-depth breakdown. So this notion of what it means to be geek, uh, many people can identify with, but they're actually uh, only in recent years starting to come out. So uh, here I talk about black geek culture as one that intersects sci-fi, comic books, movies, video games, and uses each to both complicate assumptions of blackness, technology, pop culture, gender performance, spirituality, intellectualism, entertainment, philosophical inquiry, and notions of future. That's going to be important later. Notions of future. Such practices question the hierarchy of knowledge in our academic culture and critically examine the privileging Eurocentric intellectual abstraction and imagination, opening the way for non-traditional knowledge production. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I had a conversation with my mentor, one of my mentors the other day, and, we, and she wanted to talk about um, the, the, the impact of hope. The impact of the negative impact of hope and the connection between hope and tragedy. And we had this hour-long conversation, and she said, Wow, this is really that. She said, You really must have gone through studying uh, the Greek, uh, Greek uh, myths of uh, uh, Sisyphus, right, and Hades. And I said, Well, I, I did read that, but I was talking more about Dark Knight Rises because Fane was talking about hope, and <laughs> she didn't know what I was talking about. But one of the things it raised was this question of who gets the legitimate knowledge, right? Does it have to be from the trials of Sisyphus, or is it no longer relevant because I quote the Dark Knight movie? Who gets to determine the value of knowledge and whose knowledge is worthy of discussion or not? If I just said yes, that's where I got it from, the trials of Sisyphus. Now, am I a professor? Do I get to be considered intellectually relevant now? What if I was citing the last Superman movie? Now, is it not relevant? Do the merit of my ideas change because of where I got them and how they're influenced? That was the question that it began to lead me with. And I've been pondering on it knowingly and unknowingly for years. Who gets to legitimate the production of knowledge? And that was one of the reasons I fell in love with African studies, because African studies asked the same exact question. Who gets to legitimize this? Right. You have scores of historians and scholars in Africana that are often not looked at in the mainstream because of the impact of their ideas and what it may mean to the political narratives in place. So I found them to be very similar. Now I'm also going to be using this term, transcontextuality, and this refers to a practice of transitioning and connecting diverse knowledges from the different from the worst diverse sources, illustrating the complexity and breadth of the given subject. Right? So I connect things that some people may not want to connect, may not find it relevant. I often find relevance in those kinds of connections. So in terms of giving you a sense of what I mean by black geek, this is, this is it. And, and I can tell you, you know, I put this picture up because it was a perfect image of the kind of people I find myself around. And if I ever read that sister with the Shazam lightning bolt, she gets love just for the shirt. I'm telling you, that's, that's hot. Okay. But why black geek? Um, there are a couple of things that I mentioned before, but I wanted to kind of expound on as we, we go on about uh, what it does, what Black Geek does in many respects. And it disrupts some very kind of popular notions. Notions of blackness, right? What does it mean to be black? And when I ask my students those kind of questions, what does it mean to be black, I get almost a description of a music video back. You know, these kinds of images that we've seen in pop culture for a long time. How you're supposed to dress, how you're supposed to speak, how you're supposed to handle yourself in the midst of, say, a potentially violent situation, or with the police, or you know, with the opposite sex, these very kind of um, familiar ideas. And yet, at the same time, I'm running across people that don't represent those ideas, and I myself do. And, and especially in geek culture, uh, which you'll see in a moment, you'll see examples of how that takes place. Um, uh, media representations and popular thought. In terms of what black geek culture interrupts, uh, it forces you to challenge media representations because you don't often see the kinds of narratives you're interested in when you come out of this black geek framework. So you're able to kind of approach it from a different way. And I talk about imagination, or rather the imaginary, a space where we conceptualize an ideas, worldviews, so on and so forth. So in that, one of the most critical 
and I mentioned it again at the bottom, one of the most critical aspects of black geek, with geek culture is the appreciation for the imagination. Imagination is currency in and of itself. Right? The true technology is actually imagination. Um, and so some of the other things up here we'll look at in a moment. Uh, production of intellectual information, knowledge, uh, performances of gender, um, perception of the future, all of those we'll get into. And I include a picture here of Melvin Van Peebles, um, writer and director of Sweet Sweet Bad's Badass Song from 1971, because what we see with his work is really the development of one of the first black superheroes. If you haven't had a chance to see the film, go back and watch it. His son also released a film about the making of Sweet Sweet Bad's Badass Song. It's called Badass. If you didn't get a chance to see the original, at least see that one. But what he does in many respects is black geek and orientation. It's this idea of creating heroes and actually beginning to study and examine the ideas associated with them. Now, um, some of this is cut off, um, so I can't show the whole thing, but I will say I include this image because uh, one of the things that black geeks can engage in is the power of media, which for the 20th century, even, and particularly for African Americans, has a groundbreaking impact. But has anybody ever seen this image before? One person. This is, um, this is an image that is actually taken out of the Congo. And this is a gentleman named Saba. Can anybody tell me what he's looking at? Let's so we'll look around. Who? Huh? Limbs. That is the hand and foot of his six-year-old daughter, who was killed in the Congo for not um, producing as much or acquiring as many rubber plants as the foot acquired. This image went around the world, and it began to have an incredible impact because this is the onset of visual technology, and it shamed most of the quote-unquote developed world. This is at the hands of the Belgian government, um, but the impact it had just in terms of this image, and don't get it twisted, the civil rights movement was very similar. If Martin Luther King and SCLC, well, I said SCLC didn't have his name, but if, um, if Martin Luther King did not have cameras with him during many of those marches, do you think we would have reached the point we did, so to speak, in terms of popular ideas about how black folk were treated, particularly in the South? Those images you've seen a thousand times, or those videos you've seen where they're, the, they're shooting uh, hoses on people, having dogs attack them, most particularly hoses and dogs against older women who are out walking the streets protesting, those images had an international impact. They literally shamed the United States in the world court because the United States held itself up to be the standard across the world. So the image, in many respects, has a power of its own. Now, I wouldn't argue that these changes would not have taken place without millions of people who, just, who were active in trying to change these forces. But I am saying, in terms of what black geeks engage, the power of the image is one to be grappled with and taken seriously. Now, one of the things I, I try and argue, and most of this presentation will have to do with teaching Africana studies, I like to merge black geek culture and Africana studies, and I think it produces a couple of different things. It gives us an opportunity to study different kinds of conceptualizations of blackness that don't always make the news. Right? It allows us to stimulate the use of technology in new and creative ways. This is actually an app that I have. My students do a good portion of their homework off the app. Right? So alternative ways of approaching the production of knowledge, the acquisition of information, so on and so forth. Um, allows for transcontextual approaches to teaching, which I'll show you in a moment, and examines methods for teaching history, locality, gender, body image, sexuality, women, both for all of those. But in and of itself, aligning this kind of approach to information and linking it with Africana studies can be incredibly fruitful in terms of being creative and creating new spaces, new ways of knowing. I start with Africana history. If any of you are familiar with a couple of the images here, this is a comic book that came out uh, a while ago called Truth, Red, White, and Black. And it was actually a comic book that presupposed 
that Captain America uh, did not become who he became overnight, that the serum he was given was experimented on African Americans first, African American soldiers. I used to have my students actually read the whole comic, and then we would actually get into African American history. Right? What historical situation does what I told you remind you of? I heard somebody on Absolutely. That's key. Right? So, you know, depending on, especially my, um, my first year courses uh, for first year students, it's one of the introductory points to bringing in how African American history goes about. Uh, so in this instance, we can actually get into the Tuskegee experiments, syphilis experiments, but we also start to talk about the um, mass town lynching, like Rosewood, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Georgia, Missouri, Arkansas, right? and using pop culture as a way to kind of connect. It, I found that you know the students actually respond to it because in one vein, um, here is this fictional element that they're enjoying but finding out how realistic it is and how it connects to things that actually did occur becomes incredibly impactful. So I use this method to kind of connect different things and ask new questions about how we understand. This is another. Um, I had my issues with the film Django, but nonetheless, it becomes a very interesting jumping off point to actually talk about slavery. It's one thing to have a classroom full of people that really are indifferent to the concept of slavery, and I'm talking about it, versus a room full of people who are actually excited about having seen Django, but have questions about what actually occurred. Right? Was it realistic? How often did it happen? So things of that nature. And from there, we can actually have some critical dialogues about the impact of um, enslavement or the Mahatma. Right? So we talk about it from here. And we can talk about the various stages of enslavement that impacted that number you see at the top, 30 to 300 million people killed and displaced. Well, each one of those issues helps shape that number. So when you're talking about the overlapping slave traders of East and West uh, Africa, when you're talking about the acquisition of Africans and having them being marched out to the coast, sometimes hundreds of miles, when you're talking about the forced migration over slave ships, or the seasoning process, right? or plantation life itself, each of those stages allows us to better understand the impact of this process on African people. And from there, to connect it to elements of pop culture that they can identify with, and at the same time, disrupt some of the elements in pop culture that aren't historically accurate. Those, that conversation can be far more engaging when it comes to dealing with people who are interested but don't know how to make the connection. So pop culture becomes very useful in many regards in terms of that. So in, in regard to history, one of the angles that I try to approach is to actually take advantage of these kind of moments in popular culture. I call this one teaching black locality. Um, here, Dr. Joseph Holloway uh, out of uh, Northridge talks about why African people were chosen for enslavement. And when I was a kid, the most they told us was that black people were chosen because they were good in the sun. Uh, that was the excuse that I was, I was given. And then there was, of course, the, the paragraph in that I had a game speech. And that constituted Black History Month. Because I think we read the paragraph every day. And that's, that, that was the entirety of African American history. But uh, here, he talks about the very specific types of crops that Africans were very skilled at being able to grow. Right? And he actually talks about the extent to which they were sought after for what they could do, rather than this idea that they were just taken because they could work hard. And one of the things I do is I connect that to uh, both popular culture and our immediate global environment. All right, so this gentleman here, Will Scott, is a farmer in Fresno uh, who has been actively trying to pull together black farmers and get the government to extend to them the same access and resources that they extend to large corporations and white farmers. All right, so he's actually initiated this movement and at the same time, and actually he sued the federal government over this, if I'm not mistaken, but he's also trying to make sure that we don't forget how to farm. How many of you, if the grocery store is shut down today, can actually grow a farm and feed your family in the next year? So mind you, I only have my hand up to just kind of show you how to raise your hand. I, I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> and that's partly what he's talking about. How dependent have we become? on corporate food production. 
and what impact does that have? Well, he's my grandparents' age, and most people I met in the African American community whose grandparents or great grandparents came out of the South could grow food, and often still did, even when they moved to California or the North. They always had a background, a backyard, a little patch of vegetables here and there. And every time I visited, they'd be like, ooh, let me have tomatoes, let me grow those tomatoes. I'd be like, I'm Taco Bell, got tomatoes, I don't know. But I didn't understand the importance of that. And I did not take advantage while they were still here to ask them how to go about doing it. So I'm at a point now where if the grocery store shut down, I wouldn't know how to begin anything. Right, which, ironically enough, is what that film, many of you saw, it's called Idiocracy, with Terry Crews, the picture at the bottom left, he plays the president. And, he's and the film was actually about an era where there's mass ignorance on all kinds of things, and one of which is farming. They're trying to grow crops with like Gatorade and wondering why the crops don't grow. And as completely stupid as this movie is, it isn't far from most people I know. Which is why I put the image up there. So again, when I talk about transcontextuality, we'll watch that. And then I'll ask you how stupid it is. And then I'll ask you if you want to grow your own crops. How stupid is it then? Now, teaching gender. One of the things I do is teaching black gender in terms of transcontextuality is we look at the experience of gender both in its historical context as well as how it's represented in popular culture. And so as we talk about black womanism and feminism or black masculinism, I try and cite examples from pop culture to get people to think, right? kind of expand how they approach the thing. But historically, at least in the West, what I like to do is give people a sense of where the ideas that continue to shape our reality come from. In terms of masculinity, the popular definition of masculinity and manhood in the West comes from the English aristocracy and eventually the slave-owning landowners here in the West. Right? That is the popular definition of masculinity and the characteristics are listed in the middle. Because right? who on the plantation had the power to completely impact everybody's lives with not the slave owner. And so in this, we talk about um, the history of masculinity in this regard, and the extent to which African masculinity was put in contrast to westernized masculinity. And on a plantation setting, where people are able to enact power, act out power in very particular ways, we find that many African-American males could not do so. And so this became, in many respects, the standards of masculinity that many of us still abide by today, right? Does materialism still shape our definition of manhood? Does how much I own still shape our definition of manhood? And if that does become the standard of manhood, what am I going to do to acquire the trappings, symbols, and whatnot to show you that I have it, right? So I may not actually have money, but I can buy the symbols of money. I can get my hands on a Mercedes. I can make sure I have designer clothing. All of which is designed to make you think that I actually have wealth. So for the wealthy, this is definitely the standard. For the poor, the trappings of wealth, the, the illusions of it are the standard. But it still goes back to this defi definition here. So when we talk about masculinity and how African masculinity is disrupted in the West, this is one of the first places we start. And as I start to look at the experiences of women, this becomes a very interesting point here. Right? Um, I talk about the Catholic Inquisition in the 11th to the 18th century. And one of the things that comes out of it as the number of, of women killed is so tremendously high, some say up to a million, if not more. Uh, the idea here was to create a persona that became a standard of womanhood in Europe. And that persona I refer to as the submissive, submissive Western body feminine. This idea that women are delicate, need to depend on others. Matter of fact, their beauty and their dependence marks their femininity. And right? so this, this, this kind of innocent notion that we see highlighted on plantations all the way through uh, to now in many respects becomes the standard of womanhood in the West. Ironically enough, this is also the same standard that black women are measured by. How delicate and dependent can you be in slavery? Can you wait for someone else to come work your crops for you? Is someone going to come save you 
from the slave owners who decide to take your body at any given time. Black women are not allowed the luxury of delicate and, and, dependent, and dependent and so on and so forth. So it becomes an idea that is not only constructed in Europe and applied violently on women in Europe, it becomes a standard that black women are measured by. And I also mean that in terms of beauty. Because the idea, when I showed you on the other slide for physiognomy, is that the standard of beauty, in many ways, still goes back to these ideas here. So whether it's in lifestyle or in, in, in how one looks, if the standard comes out of this framework, how do black men and women fare? Right? So we talk about the impact in terms of dealing with gender here. And we end up with what uh, Patricia Hill Collins refers to as control the image. These become the most popular tropes for defining black masculinity and femininity. And I want you to keep in mind, the last two slides I showed you, this is the result of black men being compared to black slave owners and black women being compared to an idea of Western femininity and what you end up with are these stereotypes. Now the ones in the middle are kind of exclusive to both. I'm impressive, hyper-violent, hyper-aggressive, unintelligent. Hypersexual is one of the most consistent, consistent definitions tied to hyper-violence, um, hypersexual. Dehumanizing, uncaring about relationships, incapable of succeeding. Right? Um, and the particular ones that we see given to both categories. Black women, domineering, emasculating, too strong, unfeeling, manipulative. Sound familiar? Do we still see these in pop culture today? Notice particularly how each one of them contrasts the very idea of the standard of beauty in the West. And it's the same for black men, physically threatening, uh, weakened intellect, violent, manipulating, irrational, on so unemployed, unemployable. Right? Lazy. Lazy is a very interesting one. You've been hearing that one since enslavement. Right? The idea that black men are lazy. Um, and lazy is contributed to blackness as a whole, but it's, it's very targeted in many respects to black men. And often those who are actually initiating uprisings on plantations were labeled the laziest. It did not have to do with whether or not you were energetic enough to produce. It had to do with whether you contrasted the system of production that was not in your interest. So laziness becomes a very key term in and of itself. But these stereotypes are a product. These gendered and racist stereotypes are really a product of what we see earlier in terms of the standard being constructed in the West. Now, some of you may be familiar with this show that is on the internet. Uh, it's called Misadventures of Awkward Black Girl. And one of the reasons I show it, because as we talk about black youth culture and we talk about productions of gender, gender and race, uh, one of the things that I like to do is offset what we become familiar with, right? And I find this is a, a great way to go about doing it, because in this show, one of the things she does is demonstrate the various ways that blackness and gender do not always work in regard to how they're presented most often. Um, let's see if I can get this. I'm going to play a couple of clips for you. Um, it's called Misadventures of Awkward Black Shithole, I never would have met Frederick and my life would be separated. <laughs> <laughs> Management. Look, Jay, some heifer jacked my parking space at IHOP last weekend. You know what? I did not rig out. I just waited and exhaled. So, that's your advice? Breathe? Jay, your attitude is not conducive to our positive working environment. <laughs> 
This is for your own good, girlfriend, and our safety. Okay. Hey, what's up? Oh, what's up, Papa? I'm able. I'll be safety. What do you do? Uh, it, it do, I guess. That's what's up, boy. That's what's up. I'm gonna, hey, I'm gonna go get some. I'm gonna go get some drinks. You stay like right here. I'm gonna try on. Why does CC sound like contemporary? What was that? Black guys love when I talk like that. Indeed. What's up? He's getting a drink, see? Oh, hell no! Great. Now I'm by myself. If this party is a competition, I'm losing. Could things get any worse? I brought you a drink. Oh, energy, so. But you were drinking the night we passionately made love. We did not fucking make love. We had sex! This is a fucking mistake. I'm going to see you now, Strunk. So, get the fuck out of my way. strong, 
all of these types of things, those become images that become very popular. But seldom do we talk about the impact. On the right, you're looking at the impact of anorexia and bulimia, particularly in black communities, one thing we don't talk often about. Right? If you hear about anorexia or bulimia, it's often with other communities, not necessarily in our home. And similar on the left, this gentleman was an avid um, uh, steroid user. His tricep exploded. Mm -hmm. So again, looking at the impact of such things as say body dimension and relating it to black geek culture, right? I'll actually have people read comic books both from Milestone and from Marvel or DC, and then we begin to look at the impact of body and body image right, in our culture and really what does it get at? Um, one of the things uh, Jackson Katz does in his video, I think it's Tough Guys too, he talks about the size, the musculature of male toys over the last 30 years and how much larger they've gotten. So this addiction to looking beautiful can have adverse effects on both black men and women. And we don't often talk about it. So for me, black geek culture is an interesting way to kind of raise those conversations. And by the way, these are not drawings. What I cut out is for each of these two women, there's a drawing right next to them that looks almost identical, but these are photos. So you get to see the way she actually looks exactly like the drawing, but in the drawing it looks dope. On her, very different thing. So the contrast between reality and our imagined sense of what is an acceptable size that women should be. Right? We also look at the impact of our culture the experience altogether. When we talk about uh, boys, for example, the kinds of toys and the kinds of institutions that boys are introduced to have very specific purposes. Um, the action-oriented heroes and soldiers, in many respects, prepare boys for sacrifice. This idea that their value is found in violence, negotiating violence, and what they can do for other people especially in regard to violence, protection, providing, so on and so forth. And even in our popular sports scenarios, right, again, going back to this idea that more so than getting a 4.0, your value is found in these kinds of institutions, institutions that are rooted in entertaining others at the sacrifice of your own health, right? or protecting others at the sacrifice of your own health. The boys' culture, in many ways, is very much tied to that. And the impact on men, black men in particular, is actually in along the same lines. It's what I call the preparation for disposability. Each of these fields is overwhelmingly male, and they are what we can call death professions. And I include gangs in here because after the 1980s, gangs became a profession, specifically for those whose jobs were removed out of the black community. Where else could you go? Gangs actually became a source of revenue. I ain't telling y'all nothing in LA. Right? But each of these is what I call the death profession. And by and large, the idea that one sacrifices for others uh, is intricately tied to the success of these uh, various types of labor. But by and large, have a high death rate. As a matter of fact, you might not believe it, but sanitation workers actually have some of the highest death rates out of everybody up here. Sanitation workers actually experience a great deal in terms of death, in terms of sickness, impact from the job. <coughs> but the impact here, from what I'm describing in this culture, is the expectation of men and what they're supposed to do to receive love, affection, attention, so on and so forth. So these ideas about protecting, providing, and sacrificing go very deep in our culture um, and again are still measured against that initial image I showed you of the slave owner in the English aristocracy. He's acquiring wealth, but that wealth is at the cost of his own health. These are the ideas that are kind of tied into what we do. Teaching black sexuality. In terms of black geek culture, I use different examples. Um, in the film Fifth Element, right? we have the kinds of things to talk about the various ways we perform our sexuality and how it's received, right? whether or not uh, it's something that we should ascribe to or not. Most of our sexual behavior 
in the black community is highly conservative. That comes out of a very particular background. Right? The background of stereotypes about hypersexuality, and uh, from that, our retreat to the church as the space for social policing. The church was actually one of the places we were allowed to congregate, but at the same time, in many respects, its hyper-conservative approach to sexuality was very purposeful because we came out of the history of stereotypes of hypersexuality. So it's interesting to see that kind of change. And what that leads to in many respects is what we can see in the top right. Now this is, of course, an extreme. But this is a man killed because people suspected he was gay. Not that he was, which in and of itself is still a problem. But can you imagine that? Somebody looking at the way you walk, the way you talk, and deciding that you must be, and then somehow that deserves the kind of response we're seeing. So I use various types of media to get across the idea that our performances of sexuality are very linked to very specific histories. And our media serves to reinforce these ideas with very consistent behavior patterns. And from there, we judge each other based on how well we perform those behavior patterns. Masculine, feminine, so on and so forth. Spirituality. Godhood is standards for masculinity in the ancient and contemporary world. Entity that helps social engineer acceptable gender performances. So what I mean here is that when it comes to the ideas of Godhood, whether they're thousands of years old or whether they're today, they very much shape our gender performances. And when I talk about divinity in the context of black, group, black, black geek, trans contextuality, what I do is I disrupt intellectual, uh, the, the so-called intellectual benefits of traditional spiritual focus. And I ask questions that force people to think in different ways. Um, I try to unsettle assumptions about what I call crystal normativity. Anybody know what that would mean? Give me an example. When I first moved to Fresno, I was coming out of the Denny's and I saw an older sister. And you know, she walked up to me and she said, you new here? I said, yes. And I don't know why, because I guess I don't look like Fresno. I don't know where that came from. And she said, well, I want to welcome you here. She said, where do you church? And I thought that was interesting, because I didn't know church was a verb. I had never heard that question. Where do you church? I, I didn't know how to answer the question. But tied to her question was the assumption that I was Christian. I could have been a Buddhist. I could have been a Muslim. Now, in the African world in the global sense, Islam is actually, in terms of people of African descent, the most popular religion. But her assumption was that I must be Christian. So when I talk about crystal normativity, it has to do with the assumption of how we practice and what we believe. Right? Authorizes the relationship between the imagination and the spirituality. Black deep culture, as you'll see in a moment, plays in this space of imagination and spiritual practice. Now, before I go there, I also wanted to show you, there are about seven slides we're going to look at where you get to see um, in pop culture, in comic culture, and film culture, this idea of white masculinity being tied to divinity. This is a comic book character, as you can tell, called Majestic, who at one point becomes God. And you can see him standing over the earth. Right? You see this is a fairly popular trope in a moment. Green Lantern. Right? actually read any of the Dark Knight Returns comics. On the top left, he's actually standing in front of the earth and the moon. Okay. Uh, and association of these kind of images is again for holding the earth. Now, this is actually related to a comic book series that came out in 1999 called DC One Million, and it actually had to do with um, Superman actually kind of being a Christ figure of sorts, kind of coming out of the sun. And there are some overlapping traditions that go back to Egypt and Greece and Judeo-Christian practice that kind of serves to buttress this. But the idea here being that, again, we're talking about the sun of the sun. And there's some others, uh, Beowulf, the popular um, kind of mythos that was related to Christianity in many respects. Beowulf himself becomes a kind of Judeo-Christian figure. 
around the time that Christianity begins to overtake Northern Europe, and we see popular films coming out in the last decade on the mm -hmm. And then some of you might be more familiar with. How many of you have seen Tron Legacy? A couple of you? Right. So here you have the maker, the son of the maker, and um, this kind of mysterious figure here who becomes a kind of form of visual divinity, if you will. But Jeff Goldblum's character on the left actually plays this creator of Tron, so they treat him like God in person and call him the maker. And will even kneel in his presence and worship him. These ideas here about white masculinity and divinity being tied together. And I think, of course, this one that we're all familiar with, right? the Neo, it's the one, so on and so forth. So these ideas, many of the Gnostic in orientation, being kind of implemented. And yet, when I show these different types of films in class and we kind of talk about these images, people get very excited about the ideas. But when we start to talk about black geek culture, it gets to be a little interesting. Anybody know who this is? Storm from the X-Men? Well, what you'll find is that in many respects, especially in black geek circles, Storm is very tied to Europe in, some of the, in terms of some of the abilities she has. In other words, this kind of pop culture use of her is one thing, but the relationship between her and African cosmologies becomes a very uncomfortable point for others. So when we start to talk about divinity, we start to talk about African culture, we'll find that even in these pop cultural spaces, people get uncomfortable because they're not really used to seeing these kind of characters. And some of them, as with the next one, actually relate to African history more directly. The bottom left is a comic book that came out in 1986 predicated on a heroic figure that is credited in ancient Egyptian society as being the initial motivation um, and uh, the point of mimicry that comes much after in terms of what we see later with the Christ. And so Heru, son of Aset, son of Asar, or as many of you may know, uh, Osiris, Isis, and Horus, Heru was Horus, uh, becoming the trinity uh, and this kind of jumping off point for what would later come about when Europe appropriates from Africa, or should I say Romans in, in particular. But I had my students read the comic book, and then we actually look at the history. And we find that even though this is a comic book, what we're actually seeing is images that are older than what we're familiar with, but appear to be younger, and they appear to be tied to uh, entertainment. And then I show them some of the images that might bring it home a little. This is actually a room sitting here. Right? I made it to comic book form, but found some of the initial statues that you might see. Right? The Black Madonna in the middle, and then of course what we see coming out of Rome much after. Right? So the relationship between these kinds of comic images and then what we actually see and have grown up with in another context. And the question that one can kind of ask is, who gets to determine which is more important. If these images were handed down for, from, for you and your family, from great grandparents, or grandparents, or parent, would you feel the same way that you might have felt when you first saw the fly? If you were told that that was actually the face of the Son of God on the left? What would your relationship to that be? So I use popular culture to get people to answer those kind of questions and ponder on whether or not there would be a shift, whether they would see things differently, how it would impact them, kind of related from that way. Now this is a film that I'm not sure when it's coming out, but it's, it's up for yeah. crowdfunding. Yeah. And it further kind of asks the question of where, what we value and what we don't. It's called Oya, Rise of the Orisha. Charge, 
515, and many of you have to leave, right? So we don't want to interrupt the speaker. So if you have to do that, we want to just wait a couple minutes, right, for people who need to leave at 515 to leave. Again, if you are here AFS 200, my class, Instruction African kind of Studies, make sure you uh, do the signing sheet, right? For those who have to leave now, we do have an evaluation form that we would like for you all uh, to complete. Again, we're just going to take a couple minutes to allow people to leave, and then Dr. Hassan will resume because we're actually going to find the science fiction, historical fiction, fantasy, Afrocentricity, and magic realism in non Western cosmologies in order to critique not only the present day dilemmas of people of color, but also to revise, interrogate, and re examine historical events of the past. This has been a very popular movement that's been going back quite a ways. And you can find it with jazz musicians like Sun Ra, you can find it with hip hop in terms of people like Africa Bambada, even today with Farrell, there's all kinds of people of Rel. You can find all kinds of people that are part of this movement. It's a heavy literary movement as well as a visual one. Uh, so you can see all these kind of dimensions coming together where you have what I would call black geeks engaging in trans-referencing all of these different kinds of production to basically ask the questions that are raised there, to critique, um, to reevaluate, to reconsider, to revise, to interrogate. And so in that, if we can incorporate both not only the past, uh, not only our artistic presentations, but also how we imagine the future in and of itself, it can allow for all kinds of conversations that are useful in a lot of different contexts. So, like I said, I'm going to end it here so we can have a sort of, a, a, hopefully, a few minutes of dialogue. Um, but I do want to thank you for coming. Um, yeah, so thank you. Any questions? Any observations? Any reflections? I have to stop watching it. 
which are highly problematic, are problematic to you, you can create more. You can actually go against these ideas. But it starts with knowing what those ideas are first. Because if you don't understand the history of these stereotypes, and you watch thousands of movies like I did, you'd be surprised the influences it has that you're not even aware of. Right? I think, too, uh, what I see a lot of uh, when been to, you know, I went to a concert recently. Nobody I've heard can sing like this woman. However, because she doesn't, you know, dress provocatively, she's not, you know, showing herself in a hypersexual manner, she doesn't really get the exposure that I do believe she deserves. Mm -hmm. But then you see the women who they can sing, they all right, mm -hmm. but their, you know, blonde, you know, their body, barely dressed, half naked, the videos, you really can't even let your kids watch, but these are the ones who are glorified, and then you have kids who are able to watch it, that's who they want to be like. But they don't want to be like the woman who is dressed and, you know, really doesn't sell herself in order to, you know, be on top of everything and to sell herself for money like that. And I kind of think that that also um, does have a serious impact on the youth today and what a lot of them feel they want to be or what they want to do when they get older. Oh, absolutely. I think it was Clyde Owen and later on, I think that's what it was, that actually said that if Stevie Wonder and Aretha Franklin started their careers today, they wouldn't make it. It's not enough to sing beautifully or be a brilliant artist. You actually have to look the part too. And when you think about the impact of that, it's actually quite sad. How many people are we missing because of those kinds of standards in our pop culture? Right? Are we have time for one more? Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I, I have a question. Let the student go first. I have a question too. Let the okay. student go first. I guess since we can't get the first real estate, how can we actually learn more and get better introduced to the subject of the black geek outside of the forum. Um, man, this is going to sound Because I know you have a website, I can actually look at it, but you know, you have more of a structured format that we could probably actually come to more forward with. Okay, um, so you're asking where else can we kind of we'll come into this? Yeah, yeah, like once you leave here, how do I get you know, obtain more information in a structured format as you have here. Well, there are a number of texts and websites that have to do with Afrofuturism that definitely tie into that. A number of blogs you can Google that are pretty, pretty straightforward there. Um, I have a couple of blogs, one I do on black masculinity, one I do on ancient religions, but each one of them I do just what I did here. I incorporate stuff from different contexts to kind of tie it in. So um, I try and do it there. There's all kinds of sources, but I would say start with um, looking into Afrofuturism. And you can actually also search for Black Geek. You'll find a, num a number of key uh, websites there. One of the pictures I had was of a group that called themselves the Black Tribbles. which is a radio show that I'm sure you can actually find them online as well. Uh, but those are some of the starting points I would suggest. And of course, anything I write. <laughs> Uh, I, mean, uh, I appreciate the image uh, you showed of uh, Muhammad Ali uh, defeating Superman and uh, I think uh, society doesn't give uh, Muhammad Ali a just do what he contributed to humanity. And not only that, he was a bad man on the planet. He was a uh, science fiction character. Okay, absolutely. I mean, and it's interesting to note that in, in popular film, uh, what we see many of the superhero characters doing, we actually have seen real life people doing in, in one way, shape, or form in terms of being able to run incredibly fast, being strong, uh, being able to outwit opponents, which is really one of Ali's greatest gifts, not just his physical prowess, his intellect in the ring, those things we don't talk about. Um, so there are a number of ways that um, athleticism, uh, African culture has contributed to this kind of sci-fi orientation, but it's jazzed up and made to look completely separate from reality. But real life people influence this on an everyday basis. 
And so it's, uh, it's often pretty good to engage in these kind of discussions, especially with that beat, because it will go from sci-fi to historical reality, where the connections can be made. Right. Uh, uh. All right. Thank you.